Good job, David. Mary, did I send you that link for the meeting on Friday? Yes, I got it. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and read the script while we wait for Josh to show up. Is that okay with everybody? As a preliminary matter, this is Janet Schulte, Director of Culture and Tourism. Permit, permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mary Mallory's. Yes. Matt Peel. Here. Liz Holland. Peter Morrison. Here. Sharon Quigley. Here. Uh, thank you. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. David Sharp. Yes. Janet Schulte, I'm here. I anticipated speakers on the agenda. Chief Pittman. I'm here. Chief Murphy. Good morning. Lieutenant McPicker. Good morning, how are you? And Ms. Baxter. I'm here. Great, thanks. Good morning. This open meeting of the Visitor Services Advisory Committee is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will not feature public comment. For this meeting, Visitor Services Advisory Committee is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the meeting. All supporting materials have been provided. Members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. We will now turn to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your names before speaking. 
If members wish to engage in conversation with other members, please do so, do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Uh, any votes taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. I don't see Josh on here yet, do I? No, I'm going to uh, reach out. I'm going to turn to Mary then as the vice chair to um, ask for the motion to approve the minutes. We have received via email from the committee, uh, from uh, David Sharp and Janet, the approval of the minutes for July 13th and the minutes for July 20th. Are there any corrections? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve? Peter? So moved. Liz? Sharon? Approved. Matt. Approved. Um, please note in the minutes that they were approved unanimously by the committee on today's Zoom. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Um, I'm going to provide a little context for our guests to understand what we've been up to. Uh, Libby Gibson joined us on our meeting on the 13th and asked this committee to consider the impact of large scale events on the visitor experience. So the committee had a discussion amongst itself that day. Um, and came up with some advice that we will be submitting to uh, Libby for the select board's consideration at their August 10th or 12th workshop on that topic. The next week we met with members of the hospitality community uh, and got some more feedback from them and incorporated that into our uh, advisory that we will present. And then it was suggested that we meet with public safety um, because it's clear that they, one of the big impacts of large scale events is on the public safety folks. So we're really here to have a conversation with you all to inform the advice that we will give to Libby to share with the select board as they consider moving forward what we're gonna do with large scale events. So I'll invite any of you to start telling us what the stuff, what the issues of large scale events are on, um, on your work. So you just wanna just, well, I'll go ahead and start. Um, Essentially, the uh, impact of large-scale events is, has been getting more and more um, of a burden onto the public safety of Nantucket over the years, while our public safety assets have been on the decline. Um, as an example, um, prior to 2009, the NPD had 42 sworn police officers and 42, I believe, or 41 um, what they called summer special police officers. Um, and summer special police officers had full police power. But after 2008, after a 2008 incident in which um, it forced us to review and, and look at that summer special program, it was abandoned uh, because quite frankly, you're given people who were um, young, full police power with two weeks training. And you know, it just wasn't um, a sustainable model. We we went to what was called the community service officer uh, model, which um, they have no police power at all. the the most um, the, the the most impactful thing they can do enforcement wise is uh, write parking tickets. That's it. Uh, they can't do anything more than that. And we went from 42 down to 20 um, in numbers because of budget cuts. And then in, in terms of the CSOs. So, and we lost at that time, six police officers due to budget cuts, taking us down to 30 some, 30, 36. Um, so we then went through the next few years building back our full-time staff where today, um, if we had every position filled, we would be at 40 full-time staff, police officers, and we would have been at 36 CSOs, but then 2020 hit. And 2020 brought with it many challenges besides COVID, COVID being the least impactful on this whole issue in terms of public safety goes. Um, the nationwide uh, re revision of policing in America has had a dramatic attack effect on the ability 
of law enforcement agencies to hire personnel. For instance, sitting here today, we have four vacant positions for full-time police officers. And it's expected by the end of next month, uh, well, actually we've got four vacant positions and then two positions where people are off on medical leave. So we're actually six people short of full staff um, today. And uh, hiring the summer special or the uh, community service officers this year, we literally hired everybody that submitted an application and we only got 20 um, that came in the door. And when you lower your standards for the lowest position in the organization, you know you got some really big problems ahead of you. And we've experienced those problems um, all summer long. Um, but I don't see that, that phenomenon, that problem changing. We, we, we did more outreach this year than we've ever done before. Normally we reach out, Lieutenant McVicker has the actual numbers, but just as an example, we'd reach out to a couple of dozen New England um, colleges that had criminal justice programs and get their interest. We'd offer internships, that type of thing. Um, and we would have a hundred applications for 40, for 40 positions um, for CSO, summer specials or community service officers. And this year, we had 20 applications. We reached out to these colleges and universities and most of them were closing their programs down, their criminal justice programs, because all of their students are transferring to other majors out of criminal justice and law enforcement related uh, fields. We reached out then to a larger group, 160, I think it was, colleges and universities in New England and, and the East Coast. And uh, we got zip. Um, response. And we found the same thing. Many of these programs were just closing down. Um, their, their, their students are no longer interested in being police officers. So the future of law enforcement in America is really grim, um, in my opinion. Um, I, I, you know, this is something that in five or 10 years, it's going to be interesting to see what, what it looks like. So that background, let's go to Nantucket now and how it impacts us in our season in our uh, special events for a long long time we've pushed the envelope with events that we've done here on the island it just seems like it's an avalanche of of requests that come in all the time for everybody's got the latest and greatest idea um, for things they want everything from you know a major music festival to a huge golf tournament to um you know uh the pops. Um, we've even got people coming in. They want to bring in these pedal bars, these things that you know they look like trailers that you pedal around town and drink while you're pedaling around town on the public streets. I mean, these things are are every day are calling. You know, they've got the latest greatest idea that's going to make Nantucket the, the ultimate destination place um, to come to, and we fight all these things off, knowing that on average every day. On average, you've only got four police officers out there working every shift, every day here on this island. And you've got 50,000 people. That's a, that's a dangerous um, combination of, of, of um, staff levels. In, in February, it works out. But in July and August, it doesn't work so well. Um, so when we start looking at major events let's you know we'll use the pops for example because it's probably the single biggest um one day event first of all there's no obvious it's not the town's responsibility to provide um security and everything for those organizations the police officers aren't obligated to work those types of events that's a private event private fundraiser for a private organization although Certainly, I'm not downgrading the fact that the Nantucket Cottage Hospital is a key uh, facility for, you know, here on the island. But the bottom line is it's a private event. We cannot make the police officers work those types of events. We can only offer them the opportunity to work overtime or not overtime, but detailed um, time there. And the police officers have been saying for a number of years, 
it's risky, it's dangerous. Um, you know, so many things can happen, you know, at that event because of the way it's run essentially. And there's, you know, every event's different. You know, a, a lawn party that has a lot of people where you got a little concert going typically is not a high risk venture, but a political rally can be a high risk venture. And, and the POPs is no political rally, but a large group event with unrestricted alcohol consumption is a high risk venture um, for, for uh, law enforcement. The, the, the bottom, the, there is no single standard that says for every number of participants you have a police officer, but we have a town bylaw that says for every 200 police or for every 200 participants, you have to have a police officer if you've got alcohol being served. So the POPs generally being about 8,000 people, that would require 40 police officers just to police the POPs um, at that event. We don't have 40. The most, if everybody, if, if everybody who can volunteers to work extra duty for an event like the POPs, the most I could field would be about 12 officers for something like that. Then you consider the location that they're at. It's not just about where the party is. It's about all of the egress and all of the issues that transpire around that party. And Jetty's Beach is probably the single, short of being downtown, is probably the single worst location in terms of manpower demands that you can have an event on Nantucket. And why is that? It's because of several issues. It's one way in and one way out is basically the way to think about it. There's a lot of side roads that go into there. Every one of those intersections has to have a person there that's qualified and represents the town in directing, being able to direct traffic. It doesn't always have to be a police officer, but it's gotta be somebody that's trained and it's gotta be somebody who, when they're there, whatever happens, it's the town's checkbook that's gonna pay the damages. So they, they've gotta be representing the town's interests, not, not Nantucket Cottage Hospital, not you know the promoter for POPs, but the town of Nantucket because it's the town's responsibility. Some intersections require police officers because of the complexity of the traffic flow that has to go through there. So you're taken away now from the 12 available officers that we might be able to come up with if everything's going well. And you got to put them at di different intersections. And why is that? It's because of the major intersection, for instance, South Beach and, and Easton Street is a major intersection. Um, that has to have not just one, because the event goes on basically for six hours from beginning to end, you got to have two people there because one person can't stand in a road like that for six hours, directing traffic and telling people where to go. Um, so you need two or even three people there um, to deal with those types of intersections. The way the POPs works, traffic flow, is at some point during the um, event, we turn the traffic around on some of the roadways, make them one way going a certain direction. That requires police officers to do that because, you know, some guy who's driven down that road every day for the last, um, you know, three weeks and he's going a certain direction, now he can't go that direction. It causes backups because they stop and they ask questions. They want to know why even though you can see around you what's going on. And you know it, it requires a police officer to be there to make those decisions. So the demands for those locations are tremendous. Impacts on neighborhoods. We have to have three police officers at the POPs detail just dealing with um, the impacts up on top of the cliff there, up on uh, uh, Lincoln Street and down in that area because the what you got to be there to keep people from parking on people's lawns. The first person parks on somebody's lawn, it's like mosquitoes. Everybody's there following suit. And then you've got the neighbors all calling or the people who live there calling because somebody's parked on their grass. And we've got to figure out how to deal with that then. So it's best to be there early and prevent that from happening before it becomes an overwhelming burden on the resources that we limited resources that we have. So you can't put a, um, a volunteer up there to do that because the first time somebody barks back at them, they turn around and walk away. So we've tried different things with the POPs. We, you know, we tried to lessen our security 
responsibilities and focus more on just traffic control. And by to do that, what we do is we required them to provide their own site, um, site security. There's a couple of issues with this. Um, one, the town doesn't absolve itself from any responsibility by doing that because we own the venue, we own the property. Um, if, if Nantucket Cottage Hospital owned the property, then they've got not only the responsibility, but the but the, um, or the authority, but they got the responsibility goes with it. Town can't get rid of its responsibilities. So, but we've tried and we've hired, uh, required them to hire security and they have, but um, we all know what it's like to try to find housing for dozens of people on the uh, second, second weekend of August, it's impossible. And uh, for overnight lodging. So those folks, the security and everybody are on the first boat out as soon as the pop's done, even before the pops are done in you know, our experience. And we've got three police officers standing down there now scratching her head going, what am I going to do with these 8,000 people as they stream out of this venue? And what about the 800 that are going to stay at the after party and continue to drink and get stupid drunk and have to deal with that? That's become really for lack of a better term, a shit show um, after the pop. So that's why the police officers no longer will are wanting to work that type of event. This year, they flat said, we're not doing it, Chief. We're just not doing it. Now, why is that? This year, police reform changed the whole game with what we can do. It changed how we have to interact with the public. It changed what we can do when we actually put our hands on somebody. Um, it used to be you get somebody acting a fool or getting drunk in an event like that, you go up and, you know, grab them by the neck, the collar and escort them out of the place. Now, if we touch them, they go to jail. That, that's all we can do. If we touch them, we have to arrest them or we can't touch them. So now we can't just put one police officer down on these things anymore. Wherever we've got a chance where there's going to be an arrest, we have to have at least two because it's always he said, she said, I'm, deal I'm dealing with a case right now where one individual, one officer stopped two people in a home invasion the other night. And uh, he, he got there first and he arrested one. One of them got a little cut above his eye, probably from a fight he was in earlier in the night. But, the, you know, Family's now making a big deal about the police officer injured my little Johnny after he was terrorizing a family in a house. I, you know, we'll we'll get through this, but it's why we've got to have two officers at every every arrest now because you've got to have the words, you know, the the witnesses, um, and it can't be just one individual anymore encountering these things. So the the world is becoming more challenging in that respect. Now, all that being said, like this year, for instance, we tried to work with. Um, NCH to get their event going, which probably in light of uh, COVID resurgence, probably a good thing it didn't go. But uh, we offered some alternatives. There are alternatives to this. Um, for instance, it's Jetty's Beach that's the problem. It's a great location. It's wonderful. It's magical. But it's also very challenging and very, very manpower intensive. We offered Tom Nevers as an alternative because we can actually police that with a third of the people it would take to do um, jetty. So many of these events, they can continue. They just got to rethink their locations, rethink where they're doing it to try to lessen our responsibility in terms of manpower demands. Um, you know, we, we, we looked at, can we get off island um, assistance, police officers? Well, you got to remember. So, there's only a couple of situations which you can get uh, off island um, police to come over here and have authority as police officers. One is in, in a natural man-made disaster and an, an emergency is declared, we can call or implement a mutual aid uh, request and we can get you know police officers from elsewhere in the state to come over, but that takes time. Another one is we have an agreement with the Cape Cod where we can have officers come over and work details. Um, and that can be arranged ahead of time. And this is what we looked at for the POPs this year. And when I reached out to the police chiefs on the Cape about the possibility of getting some extra staff, they all just looked at me and said, you don't think we don't have things going on in our towns? 
And so there's no way we're going to come over there for, and, and then how are you going to get them back? And how are you going to, or, or how are you going to house them? And blah, blah, blah. It's just logistically, it was very challenging. We talked to the state police. State police was willing to do some assistance, but there's, there's some problems with that too. Um, you can't just bring other police officers from elsewhere into a community with the communications challenges and everything else and expect that things will uh, work out. Many of those police officers go in there and they're anonymous and they act like they're anonymous and then they leave and, and, they, and we're left behind with the messes um, to clean up. So that's why whenever we bring them in for this um, July 4th uh, special events, we always team them up with an Nantucket officer. We only bring as many as we can team up with Nantucket officers. Because that way, if they make an arrest, we got somebody here who can actually show up in court um, to follow through with the arrest, and we'll get charged with making a false arrest. So, um, and that way, we don't end up with somebody in our lockup that we don't know who it is and why they're there and who put them there. You know that that has happened in the past, and so uh, you know there's a lot of reasons why we have limitations on how we can use off-island law enforcement. Um, but it, you know, it, it's something that with time and a lot of advanced planning and probably a lot of logistical maneuvers can be worked out to some extent in some circumstances. But that's my spiel um, on it. I'm sure the fire chief's got a few things to add to that. Hey all, thanks for having us on today and appreciate you listening to us. Um, just want to start with kind of piggybacking on the bill and the police department. And a lot of things that people don't realize, we have half the staff the police department does thereabouts. At any one point in time during the summertime, a full staffing shift, which I only have two of at seven. When I have people out, I can go down to four. So that means I'm staffed to, to be able to take and respond to one call in normal staffing during the summer. How many times have you seen multiple ambulances and fire trucks and everything else running around? So yesterday at four o'clock, within a matter of 15 minutes, we had three calls from a possible child trapped in a hole that he dug at the beach to a person who fell and hurt their hip to a person who was baking peach cobbler for the first time and set off their fire alarm. So those are the, the range of calls that we answer every single day with anywhere between four and seven people. So when I have seven, I can answer two calls. That third call is still going to wait and our uh, response to that, that call for service is going to be delayed. And remember, we run ambulance, we run the fire truck, and oddly enough, the fire truck has been the one that's been the most busiest over the past two years not the ambulance. And that's for all different reasons because of the pandemic and because of more people staying home and, and renting places they're not familiar with and the such. So I, I just, you know, lay the basis of how many people we're working with before we have to call people back. So every time we have one call, probably about 60% of the time we're calling people back to the station to be able to try to respond with two people for that next call and then taking in the frequency of multiple calls and only having 28 people that I can take and, and draw on. Now take a major event such as the POPs where we're putting an ambulance down there plus a fire engine plus an additional unit because of the fireworks. And we're putting almost a third, probably better than a third of our people at one singular event. Now that one singular event is important, but how much more important is it than protecting the rest of the island? And what happens if I can't get a fire truck or I have a building fire that I'm showing up with seven or eight people? And a lot of things, a lot of times people don't realize is that a building fire on Nantucket is a dozen to 15 people that we have to work. If that same fire was in Katuit or was in Harwich, there'd be almost 50 people there. So one thing I said before is at a, at a meeting that we had with the hospital is that we've been doing more with less 
on this island for a long time and we're about ready to break. We're, we're reaching the point of critical mass that it's only one thing away. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't thinking worst case scenarios. So what happens if, what happens if there's that one event that produces a lot of injuries or a mass panic that produces a lot of people stampeding? And we all know people when, when they're put in a crisis situation for the most part, aren't calm and cool. All they wanna know is fight or flight and they're fleeing. So now we have an event that has maybe nine firefighters, maybe another, you know, 15, maybe 10 police officers. So you have a total of 20 to 30 public safety employees there for a crowd of how many? And then, you know, talked about private security. I purposely would have not allowed fireworks at the POPs this year or last year or going forward until they prove that their security is actually going to be there. So the past two years, their private security, which is supposed to secure the beach of the fireworks until the, the person, the shooter gives the all clear. As soon as the show is done, the fireworks, the last firework goes off and the band's leaving the stage, they ran off the beach. So that put that all on us to make sure that people weren't walking through an area where there was potential live bombs one shell that could not have gone off in those in the mortar tubes they didn't know so now how how unsafe of a situation is that and we're trusting the vent security for that um i think a lot of it and i'm not going to beat a dead horse for what bill said but location planning security um we really need to take and address these events as they should be. And the, you know, a lot of the event planners, organizations that are doing these events need to understand that the problems don't disappear when they cross the sound. The same issues that could happen somewhere on the Cape or in Metro Boston or in Worcester or Springfield or Ryan, whatever you may be, can happen here. And we have to be serious about those and really take precautions and plannings in order to make sure these events are as safe as they can be and they're reasonable size that they're not putting our people in jeopardy and the people that attend the events in jeopardy. What are your thoughts on the Main Street firework, uh, Main Street 4th of July events in terms of public safety? It always scared the hell out of me. Um, the amount of people that are there, the amount of little kids running around, the amount of wet cobblestones, um, it's always scared the hell out of me for the past 10 years being involved at a higher level um, that one kid's going to fall and hit their head. And, you know, we really need to rethink and reimagine that whole event so that we're doing it in a much safer place and in a much safer way. The idea that we're just squirting hoses and, you know, just for the fun of it is, is gotten old and I'm tired of having stand in my ears after the damn thing from little kids taking the water off the sidewalk and squirting in my head. One, one thing to consider about that downtown Maine, the big event difference between that and some of the other events is there's no alcohol involved in the Main Street thing. So that's really the only shining star about that that really helps us get through it. We, but if you was to have a crowd like that and alcohol was part of it, it would be a whole different outcome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, if I, you know, I, I would just say that. Uh, so we kind of we kind of let these events get away from us. Like, um, you know, I, I think we had the best intentions in working with the promoters of these events, and we we let them keep building and building when we we probably never should have, right? And so, just to talk about, I mean, we could talk about the pops, but I think we got that covered. But to talk about like the July 4th Main Street event, like that, that 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, that was like a manageable number. So, but now it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's enormous. I mean, that's, that's three times the size that it was 10 years ago, right? So, and how do you manage that, right? And, and all of those things keep getting bigger, right? Like, so like um 
the daffodil parade they now they're like now we're adding india street and federal street and census street and it, like what happened to just main street you know it's like it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and like i mean there's not enough street down there to put the cars right so and we i mean we sort of did this to ourselves but at the but so now we need to undo it right and so and that's going to be a hard couple of years ahead of us to tell them that but that's what needs to be done and we can tell them about our lack of staff but the, that's only part of the problem. The, you know, I think we just admit that we let it get too big and we now got to get it back under control. Matt. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you, Chiefs, for uh, talking. Um, you know, I work for for years in event management in downtown Seattle and um, worked with the city, worked with the Port of Seattle for many, many events. And one thing I'm kind of hearing from the chiefs and like the Lieutenant said is that these have kind of gotten away from you, but I, I think in the long run, a lot of these events are just getting away with murder. And I think it's time to really look at our policies that the town's putting forth and do some rewriting. I mean, you know, like the pops, for example, if they're leaving for the last boat, well, maybe the the hospital needs to hire one of the steamships or the Highline boats to take their entire staff off island. They need to start supplying a certain amount of security and things like that. I think they're raising enough money to, to take care of that. And so I think that we need to start leaning on whoever's putting these events on to start taking a little more responsibility and not dumping it on the town. I mean, I don't know how easy that is from, from a town perspective, um, but it, I, I think that these events are just, yeah, they're, they're kind of get, they're dumping everything onto the town and we, they need to start taking a little more responsibility. So I don't know, I'd love to hear some thoughts on that. I can tell you that's what we're doing in not allowing these events to have certain pops, parts of it. So that's mine with the fireworks, that's what I did. They didn't meet a standard. They didn't meet the regulations. They don't get a permit. But what we're, we're caught with in a lot of these times is different influences and um, lack of regulations we can fall back on to outright deny. There are some ways we can do it, but we also have to be very smart in that, you know, when we had our first discussion with the hospital when they came forward this year, we were very blunt. And I can say, I'm pretty sure I know I was. Um, and, you know, everybody else in the meeting was too. So that message is getting across. Um, and we're trying to do that the best that we can. Chief Pittman. Yeah, I think, you know, kind of follow up on what Lieutenant McVicker said, a good example uh, of how things have grown and gotten out of control and how our attempts to control them have been constantly circumvented um by the promoters is probably the wine festival um that used to be the the kind of the opening event for nantucket it was always kind of laid pretty laid back um it was uh one tent you know few few nights i believe it was or whatever days and it really wasn't a big manpower uh resource to take care of it however the last one we had now well, over time, it's grown bigger. It went from being a kind of a small private situation to now it, I think it's probably a commercial event. Um, the way it's going now, they've got, you know, sponsors them or, you know, them or, uh, putting boats out there and Jeeps and all kinds of commercial um, displays and everything else and people are coming and, and it isn't uncommon uh, that literally the weekend or when wine festival starts that by noon we're already dealing with drunks um walking the streets of nantucket and why why is this it's because they rely very heavily on volunteers to deal with the critical functions within controlling a, a thing like that like making sure that only people with with invites or passes get in in the tent we've actually witnessed our police officers have actually witnessed the, the volunteers being overwhelmed and just saying heck with it and leaving, leaving the door wide open to the tent. Um, 
they're supposed to pour just a little bit of alcohol into a glass and that you can taste it and move on to the next person. A little bit of alcohol in a glass, get, move to the next one. They don't. You see people walking around in a tent with a huge glass of wine completely topped off um, and then drinking it and going to the next one, getting the same thing. It's, and we've talked to them and we've talked to them year after year after year and it just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, the best year for the wine festival was this last year. And that's because we didn't have it. <laughs> that was the best May we had ever on Nantucket, I think. And it was, and it seems to me, and I may be wrong, the island was just as busy without the wine festival as it was with the wine festival. Now, the next event that comes along in the summer is, is Memorial Day weekend. It used to be the Pagawi uh, event, the big party down at the, at the uh, boat basin and stuff. And while a lot of people um, blamed Fagawi race for, you know, all the people coming to the island, I think the last two years kind of proved that wasn't the case. People came anyway, and there wasn't a Fagawi. But what we did have with Fagawi was we had a, an organization who took seriously their responsibilities for um, controlling alcohol in their venue and hiring details to deal with the problems and they we had adequate police resources at those parties they brought over um off duty officers from other communities um that weren't there in the capacity of police officers but were there in the capacity of security guards um, to work inside the tent to deal with some of the issues and the best part was they funded police details to work in town after their tent closed until the bars closed if they wouldn't have done that, we'd have been in, in deep trouble on, on Memorial Day weekends with you know the staffing downtown. Pops doesn't do that. As soon as the Pops detail is over, um, the concert's done. All those people go downtown. They go to the juice bar. They go to you know what restaurants maybe still open. They go to the bars. They go just hang out. And they're in the police officer around because they've all worked the maximum number of hours they've worked just to be just at the event. So, you know, that's really, it's from Memorial Day forward when we started, or it's after Memorial Day in the summer when we started having the problems going on. Yeah, you know, if I can just one thing to add about the Fugari and not to, not to talk them up, but, you know, for, for many years, they were a huge issue, right? And so, they took proactive steps. They they reduced their crowd size in that tent by themselves. That with, without us telling them that, they recognized that that was an issue, and they and I think they reduced it by a third one year to get it under control. So there there's a there's an outfit that was looking out for their interest and our interest at the same time. Peter, uh, you know I'm sitting here listening to all this, and I'm wondering how do we lasso all of this together so that <clears throat> it's possible to put the onus on all of the event planners and say, look, uh, we're going to score you on some kind of a risk profile. And following up on what uh, Lieutenant McVicker was saying, you're going to have to look at this. And if this is ranking as a high risk profile, uh, these are your options. You've got five, six, seven dimensions that we can work with, you look at them and tell us how you want to change this. And the dimensions that I'm hearing are location. Uh, you want to have it at a particular date or time, but you've picked a location that is riskier than we would like. And there are other locations. There's a scheduling thing, which is why are you having it in the summer when you could have it in the off uh, peak season? that would lower the risk. Size, uh, Lieutenant McVicker said, you know, you can stop letting it grow or you can make it smaller. And then limits that really score you very negatively. Uh, are you serving alcohol? Are you blowing off fireworks? And by identifying the risk profile explicitly so that everybody looks at it and says, yeah, this is really risky. We've been doing these events and there hasn't been a catastrophe yet. I look at it as a voter and taxpayer and say, 
I don't like to roll the dice this way. I'd like to see some controls. And I think that there are worthy objectives uh, long-term, which are, first of all, to perhaps grandfather in only one or two very traditional events and say, we really want you to keep coming here, but we need you to adjust. And then trying to spread some of this stuff out so that more and more of it is scheduled in the off peak season. Now that's just an analytic framework, but it seems to me that that's something that would have appeal to any taxpayer who says, uh, gee, I didn't know that there wasn't gonna be anybody answering the 911 call right away uh, for an emergency during these high risk events. Amy has how, do, how do we get, how do we, is it possible, uh, my question is, is it possible from our speakers here today, our guests, is it possible to think about putting together some kind of a risk profile uh, that allows one to just do a qualitative scoring of these things and saying, you got to pass through this initial screening test and get this down to some kind of a risk level that we can manage. Amy, you want to go next? Um, yes, I guess. Um, so we've been, I've been screaming about this for five years. So it's, it's, I'm getting a little bit exhausted about the whole conversation. We're getting into the weeds and the minutia and I'll let chief speak about having things off season and the challenge there too, as well. And, and I don't think we're looking, first of all, the risk assessment. Yes. I've already asked for that on all our properties because that hasn't been done as far as jetties, as far as, you know, liability risk assessment or bond, all of that good stuff we've asked for as well. I think I, you know, I'd prefer to get into a big picture um, conversation um, about being more proactive and planning our spaces. Um, I get shot at all day, every day with people wanting to do things. Entitlement is a word I use on this island a lot. Everyone's entitled to an event. We have 200 plus nonprofits registered on this island. Everyone's entitled. I'm a nonprofit. I should be able to have commercial activity. I'm a nonprofit. Wine festivals are not for profit. You know, so, you know, we're an island of exceptions. We have these rules with a thousand exceptions. Nantucket needs to step up. If you want to be a world-class uh, location and profit off the 1%, it needs to step up. I'm watching Martha's Vineyard right now has a little music event going on. They have a full page of prohibited items that people bring in, which is every single thing that people can bring into the pops. You know, we don't even have things like that. No one checks you at the pops. That's insane. Um, it's just basic event kind of protocols that exist. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think I've been doing this for 30 years from the Olympics on down. And it's time to stop saying, oh, well, it's Nantucket. It's not, um, you know, it, it's just, we have these things together. We just have to make that decision. And I'll say one thing that I've been trying to say is take advantage of this COVID pause that we've had. You know, COVID has been a horrible thing, but it's given us this pause. It's given us this chance. We've all had this shared experience and we're experiencing maximum capacity right now. And it's not good. I want to move. It's not good. Take advantage of this pause and determine what kind of community you want to have. We can be proactive. We can be intentional on how we plan our spaces. We're not going to sit here, get shot at saying, oh, we've got to respond to everyone who wants to have something. No, we don't. Um, you know, we don't want to piecemeal things. We want to be intentional first. What kind of community do we want to have? What kind of experience do we want to have? We want to have unique boutique types of events. Great. You know, one thing I will, uh, I will leave the second we allow commercial activity on the beaches. That's been one thing we've been very strict on. Things of that sort. We need to start there. All the other things, the risk, the liability assessments, the event protocols, they exist. We can apply them, but we have to come up with this feeling of our community, what we want. Um, and I have a lot of people who said last summer was great. It reminded me of what it was 30 years ago when we first came here. So, you know, I, I'm sorry if I'm getting sounding angry. It's just been frustrating to see this devolve over the past few years. And I really, really, really want us to take advantage of this moment and, and be intentional in our decision and let's not get into the weeds. I don't think we need to discuss very specific, if that makes sense. And then, you know, obviously the needs of public safety is, is 
Panama is the top level of what we need to do here. But, um, uh, you know, we have one last thing I'll say, you know, two things I have in my notes here is um, we have event venues. I'm talking to a bunch of other towns in the Cape, Provincetown, Barnstable, Vineyard and stuff about uh, different models and things of that sort. We have 101 liquor licenses on this island. We have event venues. We have spaces where things can operate and our public spaces can be used for family activities, for you know sports, other things like that to gather as well. We have plenty of event venues that are meant for these things. Um, and I think we also wanna take a look at the festival model that we seem to have fallen into. Um, I don't know if we're you know, really set up for a festival type of model and that's something um, we might wanna look at as well. So um, yeah, that's, that's all I've gotta say. Sharon, you want to go next? Yeah, Amy, <clears throat> thank you. And thank you everyone for enlightening me. I didn't realize the complexity of what we're all dealing with. Um, I think the events are wonderful for the tourists, but I agree that we've reached a tipping point where it's impossible for it to stay that way. But what I'm unclear about is what's the proposal on the table that every, like Amy, what is it that you would like the town to do or agree to that we're not doing? Thank you um, for that question. You know, I think it's just been, we've gotten to the point of where I wanted to get to the point where, you know, the board and others are saying, we got to sit down and talk about this. I think um, I don't have the absolute answer. Um, but just the opportunity to get people together and realize, hey, this is something we got we to gotta take a look at. Even though I've been on every side of the pops you can imagine from volunteer to on the committee to um, uh, sponsorship and all that, is I didn't understand really the full effect till I got on this side, the public safety side of what was actually going on and the, just the, the risks we were taking. So I think we're at that point where everyone is willing to talk about it. And, and it's, I, I'm not the only one who has that opinion. What, what kind of community do we want? What really works with getting all the players in place? So I think actually this is what I wanted. Um, this is, you know, having the, the workshop with the board is finding out, I don't wanna work in, you know, a vacuum. What does the community think? What do people think? Um, and be careful of some mode of some it's money, money, money. And I, you know, I get concerned about that as well, but I think this conversation and uh, everyone saying, yeah, we really need to, to look at that is where we want to go. And I think that'll help us find the answers. That makes sense. Peter. I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, what I'm talking about with a risk profile is not some deep analytic tool. I see this as just a, you know, a layperson's understanding of what is it that we've let ourselves get into, and any any taxpayer, uh, any intelligent you know voter can think this through and say, "Gee, I didn't realize there were all those risks, and I didn't realize that there were all those dimensions on which we could ask these uh, you know entities to adjust what they're doing." We need, in a sense, what we're saying is we want to have some kind of an obvious tool that can be used to facilitate a general consensus about how we want things to move sort of back a bit and along what dimensions, either in terms of calendar or in terms of size or whatever. And just say, you know, with as, as co-president of the Civic League, I think there'd be a lot of support for something that, you know, people could look at and say, yeah, I want to have that kind of assessment and I want the risk score to start to go down as it did during the pandemic. So that's just a suggestion. We don't have to do a fancy analysis, just try to thinking, thinking of it in terms of political will. How do you get the community to say collectively, we want to go further down the path uh, that, that uh, both chiefs are, are telling us we need to go down and we don't wanna take those risks anymore to the extent we have. Chief Pittman. Yeah, uh, Peter, thanks for that, because actually Chief Murphy and I have been working on that very um, thing. We actually just reviewed a first draft of one yesterday, 
um, that we're tweaking that it was it's intended to be an internal document for public safety purposes. Um, but it literally is a matrix risk analysis um, tool. And where it really needs to, um, we got to make some changes is in the um, alcohol um, part of it because it's kind of weak in that area. Um, but in answer to another question that came up about timing and scheduling, um, you know, that we're, we are a seasonal community and our what we would like to see is a lot of these big events broken up into smaller, more manageable, multiple events even, um, possibly, um, reimagining how it's done. But keep in mind that as you move into the off-season areas, we have less support staff. So for instance, um, starting mid-August, already starting this week, um, we're getting notice of from CSOs who are leaving to go back to school because they got, well, we've got seven already out of the 20 that are leaving, so in August. Um, so we lose the ability to manage traffic when they leave. And so these events have to be conducted in places where traffic isn't such a big impact as it is, um, you know, we have more ability in July than we do in August. And we've got even less ability in September and even less ability in October is where I'm getting at to deal with traffic issues. Um, our police numbers stay pretty constant uh, through the time, but traffic control assistance goes out the door. Mary or Liz, do you have anything you want to ask? Thanks, Janet. Um, First of all, thank you all for being here this morning. Obviously, it's it's very enlightening. I think some of us inherently knew some of the things you were going to say, but you've reinforced it eloquently. I think my two questions going into this were, you know, what were your three major issues? Um, you've addressed all those in terms of staffing, location, and uh, timing. And then my other sort of question was going to be, have you thought about any solutions? Well, I think it's clear that there's probably several ways of solutions that um, could be addressed. I mean, I've been here long enough. I remember when town permits didn't even exist for events. You know, Stephen knows that too. Um, so I think we've evolved in um, putting an event that was, you know, 250 people on a permit. Well, that's all changed. And um, we've morphed over time into larger events for whatever reason, some of it I think is, is happily financial for some of the nonprofits and we can't lose sight of some of that. So I think um, the suggestions I'm getting is to sit down with people, rethink, look at some of the roadblocks that we see as you know maybe a, an awful disaster waiting to happen. And we've been lucky for the past you know, 40, 50 years on some of these events. But um, I think moving forward, it probably is time to look at some of these and address it with the event planners. And I think this round table coming up in August is helpful. It's, it's, it's at a time when granted we're all busy, but it needs to be done so that we can move forward into the fall. So, you know, I thank you. And I, and I think the message I got is we're not saying let's cancel the events, let's readjust and reassess. Um, so I think that should be re reassuring for some of our nonprofits that need these events, um, but maybe the scale should be different. So thank you all for being here. Liz? Uh, I also want to thank everybody for being here because this has been incredibly informative, um, puts a lot more, um, you know, on the plate, so to speak. And I've, you know, some of the things I had come up with have already been spoken about, but um, I'm really, really looking forward to the August 10th uh, get together and see, you know, where we come out of at, at, after that. And hopefully, uh, you know, with everybody, you know, putting their heads together, we can come up with something that will, will help us in the long run. Um, I do think that the, you know, there's a lot of people very emotional about a lot of these events. So just in terms of the information that we've gotten today, I think if people had more understanding about why we're even talking about this, I think that it would be uh, help us out, all of us out in the long run in terms of the public and things like that. So if everybody's on the same team, I think that we'll be able to figure out um, 
a path through this. So, Matt. <clears throat> I just had two questions. Uh, so kind of for Amy here. So does the town currently have the ability to set those parameters in place as far as, you know, this much staff for this many people, you have to have them for this set of time. And also, do we have like a fine structure or anything set up? Because uh, when I worked with the Port of Seattle, if they weren't following the criteria, then they would find the events. Um, that's something to think about as well, because, you know, say the wine festival, things get out of hand or letting people in without passes, all that kind of stuff, serving too much alcohol, they get hit with a $10,000 fine. Well, that's going to change things for the next year. So I don't know. That's something to, to kind of think about. Um, so what Amy answer. Yeah. So, um, uh, as far as the parameters and all that, yes, um, you know, we do that. We review every single, you know, event that comes up either um, on public property or that might be um, above and beyond what a licensed uh, facility has um, uh, ability to do so. Um, the fine structure, um, we've gone through that. Um, it's getting a no, um, we have limits as to what we can find. Um, our bylaw fine, another fine right now is about $300 is the maximum. So there are laws in place as far as, as that's concerned. Um, private venues, of course, can certainly um, do more so. A lot of times what I do, with, like with the wine festival, what ended up working is um, I started to have creek cons with um, the white elephant uh, and uh, you know NIR staff and the wine festival, and I worked through them because it's their license. You know they're having an event at the at the white elephant or wherever uh, they may be, and the white elephant helped me crack it down um, because you know I I did daily reports. I saw this, saw this. This needs to end, or you know white elephant knew their license was on the line. So that tended to be where uh, we found the most uh, juice, if you want to say, on that situation. So uh, there's a lot of laws and regulations and stuff that um, might box us into certain things when we're talking about municipal property and things of that sort. So, um, but yeah, we, we review pretty much everything and then we monitor social media, which where we find things that don't come to us first too. So it's, it's a, you know, we're very um, vigilant on that sort of situation. Yeah. But being obviously a lifelong event planner, um, I know the motto, it's ask for forgiveness rather than permission. And you ask for that little bit and you push and you push and you push because your event's going and it's going to be over in a day. So, so what? You keep pushing, you pushing, pushing. So, um, so I understand that kind of mindset. Um, so, and Lieutenant McVicker, I think might have more comments on that. Well, well, first of all, Amy, you know, that workaround that you did with the white elephant, that was like super highly effective, but you right. shouldn't have had to have done that. Right? right. And it should have been that fine that you speak of, Matt. Right. So that would be fantastic if we could get that incorporated because $10,000 will make you rethink things for sure. Right. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to say, um, Mary, you mentioned that we, we should have the events, but limit them. So what happens is we um, in the last 10 years, it's like every single weekend is an event. Right. <laughs> so. The, the issue is it's compounding on the staff, right? So at the, at the, at the beginning of the sta uh, uh, season, right, we have staff that's eager to work, right? But halfway through, not so much, right? And now at an event every week, right? And um, it is bigger, right? It's, it's just too much. So we have to... Uh, we got to scale back and, and say no to some of these events. Well, it's nine o'clock. Um, anybody got anything else they want to add? Well, thank you, Chiefs, Lieutenant, Ms. Baxter, for joining us. And, um, we will write up our advice and get them to, um, I'll share them with the committee tomorrow probably, and then we'll get them to Libby uh, for the packet for the 10th. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. It's very informative.